<laughs> All right, Jeff, we have we have 34 um, of our guests here. I think that's about everyone who RSVP, although some might might filter in as we begin, but I think you're good to begin. Hey, Daniel, th thank you. Daniel is our associate publisher at the American Interest who organized us and hosts us and made sure this happened today. So, Danielle, thank you. And I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Charles Davidson, our publisher and co-founder, and our other co-founder and chair of our group, Frank Fukuyama, who I, I believe will be joining us momentarily. At any event, Anne, thank you a thousand times. Th this is really a, a treat for us. And uh, for, for those of you who are new to us, The American Interest is publication, print, online, politics, public policy, and culture, which we do take very seriously and we endeavor to, to learn more and grow more in that area. And uh, is a wonder, I think, <laughs> a treat to have today. She's a, a graduate of Yale. She spent a decade or so, I think, maybe 11 years abroad in music, <clears throat> excuse me, in Munich, writing about music and opera and art for the Wall Street Journal and other publications. She worked as a music critic for the New York Times and for 11 years uh, was the chief music critic for the Washington Post. Uh, she left recently, I think about six months ago, to continue, deepen, and complete a book, which <clears throat> we'll talk about. I'll let her talk about in a few minutes, I don't want to give any of that away, but we have a wonderful group and the aim is an hour conversation. We'll stop at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time if you're from different uh, time zones. I'm going to begin by asking you, Anne, a few questions. You'll take wherever you wish and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So that's the plan and Anne, thank you very much for making time today. Well, again, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> so, and I wanted to ask you first, <clears throat> starting very basic, forgive me, uh, I am an amateur, but I, I wanna ask this. The, the, the words music critic or the expression, the collocation music critic, it brings something different to different people's ears. Some people think that this is the person who sits and chastises the performers or calls them to account or uh, has kind of a wagging finger. Uh, some people think this is the, the person who educates us, the, the audience. In my conversations with you, you have a different vision, I would say, and you've lived this in practice. Could you tell us a little bit about what you think what you see is the role of a music critic? Well, you know, I think it's a role that's evolved a lot over time. I think we've seen different epics of what it's been. And I think the stereotype of it is certainly all those things you mentioned. And when I was a young writer, I never wanted to be a critic um, because I thought critics were bad, nasty people who said mean things about art. Um, many people probably think that about me, but I, um, as I got into music criticism and began to meet critics whom I admired, I realized that in fact, criticism is another branch of writing, of course, in which you were writing about things that mean a lot to you and you're trying to put words around them and illustrate them for other people, which is all you're ever trying to do as a writer to begin with. Um, I'm not gonna make a great case for criticism as a huge creative outlet because there are sort of circumscribed rules and templates around what you write, what you can write. I mean, the daily paper, the pages of a daily newspaper are not places to exercise your creative muscle um, any more than you can push that envelope. But I believe, and um, this emerged as the internet was starting to rise and conversations with particularly Doug McLennan, who founded artsjournal.com, which has been an instrumental sort of fo focus of, an, not only as an aggregate site of major articles around the, the arts, the performing arts and the visual arts, but for different bloggers. And Doug was talking about how a music critic needed to develop a watering hole, that it was a focus of interest, that you, you offered your criticism so people could come and select it. And I thought that was a much more inclusive vision of what one could do with this job, that it could be a gathering place, because let's face it, people who love art 
are opinionated and have their own opinions and should. The illusion that a music critic is going to lecture the masses about what they ought to think and that the masses will unquestioningly follow is not only incorrect, but it's dead wrong. That should not be what a music critic tries to do. Nobody in the field of art should be trying to tell people what to think. Um, I believe, and uh, Doug Shadle, who may be here today, um, has written in his book, Orchestrating the Nation, about the way that the American classical music scene developed in the 19th century. Some of this is baked into the DNA of American classical music through critics who did believe their job was to educate. But I see my job as being to encourage you to make up your own mind. And that if you are disagreeing with what I write as a critic and articulating why you disagree, then I've done my job. Um, the point is to give everybody who reads me the authority to have their own opinion make up their own mind rather than to put aside what they think and uh, accept what I think. Um, I think that's true of any writing about the arts or any writing in general. So, so Anne, thank you. So what, what moment in your life and career, or, or was it a process, did, did you decide that this was something for which you had passion, to write about music, but also to write about and critique performances. Was that a long process? Was that a moment where a light bulb went on? Well, some people here have heard my, my creation story. Um, I was living in Germany. I began writing journalism almost as a form of self-castigation. I had uh, been working on a novel and various things in my life hadn't worked out and I was a young person and I found myself editing a magazine. I found myself writing about the arts. I found people in America buying my articles about the arts and suddenly I was a journalist. And um, I was sitting in the office of Opera News and I had done a bunch of feature writing about the arts but I hadn't done reviews. And Opera News called me and they'd assigned me a couple of big features and Opera News is the leading publication on opera in America. And they said, we'd like to make you our critic for Germany and Austria. I was living in Germany. And I said, oh, I, I can't be a critic. I said, I have not got the background, I've not got the knowledge, and I have not got the desire, since I still thought that critics were nasty, evil people. And the editor said blithely, you'll learn and he assigned me to cover the world premiere of Karl Heinz Stockhausen's opera Dienstag from the Licht Cycle, which is a work of, uh, it's a, a large and important work by a composer whom I had no idea about whatsoever. And I was really too cowed to stand up to him any more than I already had. So I went off to Leipzig and I reviewed this premiere along with Rameau's Hippolyte Arisi. I had a panic attack in the Leipzig uh, garderobe in the, in the uh, coat check. And um, that's how I began as a critic. And I was telling that story in front of Carnegie Hall one night in the hearing of the editor. And he said, you know, some of these stories is that over time they get kind of, you know, changes. But that, that's exactly how I remember that happening too. <laughs> so criticism was, was thrust upon me in a way by my instinct as a young journalist not to let opportunities pass me by, but I entered it with a very uh, dubious attitude and a lot of self-doubt, which, I now think is probably the only way to approach a music critic's job since music criticism, in particular, I would say classical music criticism requires you to be a putative expert in so many different wholly unrelated topics that there is no living music critic except possibly Richard Taruskin who has mastered every single one of those areas from contemporary composition to solo bassoon playing to organ playing to opera to orchestras and, and more, much more. Um, so I, as someone, I, backed, I backed out of it. <laughs> so someone uh, just texted, what a great uh, creation story. And, and but before we leave this chapter of this piece, and I do want to talk about your book. Um, so I'm not asking this to you, okay? But in the music criticism business, of course, performers want good reviews. It could mean a translation and ticket sales. It certainly shapes a, a narrative, I, I suspect. Um, but what happens in that world in practice? Is there courting of the critic? Is there uh, uh, niceties? Do, does a critic, is a critic sent flowers and, and wine? Uh, is a critic bullied or browbeat? But what is that relationship like between performers and esteemed critic. 
I, I think it's complicated. You said you're not asking me, but I'm jumping in because here I am. Um, I, of course, people are nicer to you than they might otherwise be. And I've heard plenty of stories of people who I thought were kind of my friends ranting around backstage going, in one case, I'd written a good review of an artist whom somebody hadn't wanted to hire again. And the, the administrator came charging through backstage, according to several sources who later reported it to me saying, did you pay her to write that? Because I had actually praised the performance. And I thought, it's kind of wonderful to hear how much people can get angry about a positive review. Um, but no, I mean, one of the greatest occupational hazards of being a critic is that you start to get to know people in the field and they start to feel friendly toward you. And then you write something that wounds them to the quick and which is hard and, and you as the critic forget even to think about that because as a critic I'm not writing for the artist it sounds disingenuous but I'm truly writing for the reader I'm writing for all the people who are reading the paper going I'm trying to reach new audiences I'm trying to reach somebody who never thought they wanted to go to a concert but maybe had their eye fall on my review um, inevitably these friendships tend to founder or the critic begins to become less useful. Because if you're just writing to praise your friends or to praise the things you like, you lose your function a little bit. And I don't think a critic's job is to be a consumer advocate or a publicist, but I do think a critic's job is to present as unvarnished a view as he or she can of what's happening. As I said, in, in order to promote more views like that with different perspectives from other people. But behind the scenes, certainly there is a certain amount of wooing. There's a certain illusion that a critic has some kind of power, um, which I've always questioned. I think it's a mistake for critics to get too hung up on how much influence they have too, um, because these administrators are not gonna listen too much to that. We're just one person. All you can do is write as well as you can and give as accurate a view as you can of what you heard of the story of that particular night. Thank you, Anne. Uh, let, let's move now, if I may, to your book. Uh, after 11 uh, years of the Washington Post, you left recently, I think about a half a year ago, to continue, deepen, and complete a book, which I find uh, fascinating, uh, charming, and not only important historical research, but a great story. Could you tell us about the book, please? Well, the book is about the woman who built pianos for Beethoven. Um, to step back a minute, when I was thinking about what we're talking about this morning, and we had talked about being a critic and my career and my book, and I thought all of these are tied together by the issues of you know, women in classical music, um, the challenges women have in classical music. Classical music is struggling right now with diversity in many respects. Um, the fact is I had never had an idea that there was a woman who built pianos for Beethoven until I was in the Beethoven house in Vienna years ago now. And um, the curator there lifted the lid off the piano and said, here, play the piano. And I, I can't play the piano. So I, I, all I can play is Send in the Clowns by Sondheim. And I was not going to do that to Beethoven's piano. So I played a couple chords and um, he put the, the lid back on and said, now you can never wash your hand again. He said that piano was built by a woman. And I said, I, I thought I'd heard him wrong. And he said, no, no, you could look it up. So I did look it up. And um, she was a virtuoso. Um, her father was one of the trailblazing piano builders of the, 19, of the 18th century. Um, Mozart loved her father's pianos and Mozart heard her play when she was a child. She learned piano building from her father, took over the company when he died, moved it from Augsburg to Vienna. Um, established it in Vienna, was a great friend of Beethoven, knew Haydn. She and her husband built a kind of precursor of Steinway Hall where all the luminaries passing through would play before they played at the Konzertverein, which she and her husband helped establish. And then her son grew up and took over the business from her and her son became Brahms's favorite piano builder. So this story is a really organic way to put women back at the heart of the classical music story. Um, and once I began researching, I realized that women were there. This woman that I'm writing about was not some unicorn. Um, there were lots of active women, as historians know, at that period. Um, what fascinated me too was that at the time, women were far more regarded, and it was the 19th century, particularly the Metternich era in Vienna, that began to write them out of history. So that music dictionaries that in 1796 had lots of women, the same 
publication in 1896 had written all those women out, but had all the same men still in there. Um, so it's been a, a cultural process as our canon forms and solidifies, the women have been excluded from it. And um, I mean, this book is a, a modest contribution of the many ways that the woman's voice needs to be put back in there to the great enrichment of everybody. You know, Beethoven's biography becomes a lot less colorful when you read it through the lens of it only being interactions that he had with other men whom you might have heard of. You know, biographers often make the choice to edit the women out without even realizing it because the women are less important. It becomes a vicious cycle. And I'm doing this as a historical novel in part because the template of biography, as Carolyn Heilbrun said years ago in her book, Writing a Woman's Life, is a male template. We tend to measure achievement on the male template of achievement. And the fact that this woman had a huge achievement in having it all. She had a happy marriage. She had kids. She had biz a business that was successful. Um, we struggle with that today. I think the best way to tell that is through a novel that allows equal play to all the aspects of her life and allows me to go off on tangents, which I'm fond of doing, rather than an academic book, which will sort of boil that down to the essence of boxes that can be ticked about what she achieved in a very limited benchmark of achievement. And how do you research such a book or how have you undertaken the research? Is this a lot of archival work? Is this interviews? Are you traveling a good deal? How do you collect the material for such a historical novel? Well, you know, I've been poking at this book for years and I put it aside twice to write my two other books. And, um, but I have, I have traveled in Vienna. I mean, I've traveled to Austria a couple times. I've been in touch with the family. She has descendants who have an archive. Um, in the years since I've been working on it, a lot more is available online. There are a lot more musicologists working on this. There are some wonderful musicologists in Germany and Austria I've been in touch with. Also the whole socio, um, sociological dimension of it has been fascinating to me. So I've been in touch with a sociologist who does research in Augsburg. Um, primary sources, of course, there are reams of newspapers to wade through. Um, a lot of that is now fortunately online. Um, lots and lots of reading. I mean, I could spend years more just researching. I'm trying to push into the writing because I don't want to spend until I'm 90 doing all of the exhaustive research perfectly. But um, it's a lot of fun. It's the kind of work I've always loved doing. And um, I would have continued probably trying to do it on the side of my book until I discovered that if you're gonna write a historical novel, you could not get a publisher for that um, until the novel is finished, as opposed to a nonfiction book, which you can sell with a few chapters and an outline and a, and a thesis. And, um, but with a the novel, they wanna see the whole thing. There are just too many novels. And I thought I'm really never gonna finish it if I'm trying to work at the same time, unless I have a contract for it. And, um, and I also think that it's really healthy for a critic to change jobs after 10 or 11 years. Um, I think you get, you don't want to start repeating yourself. It's art and you want to approach it freshly. Um, I recently found a video that I made in 2013 in Montreal that they want to, they're putting up on a website now. It was a colloquium about the role of taste and music. And in that interview in 2013, I said quite vehemently that critics should stop work after 10 years or change jobs. So I was very proud to be able to write them back and say, I, I did that. I took my own advice, um, hopefully clearing the field for somebody fresher and leaving me with new energy for my book. And thanks. Um, let me touch on one final thing, my side, just in this, this introduction, we've started the last 20 minutes, then we're gonna open it up. Uh, <clears throat> to people on the line in the Zoom discussion. And on the subject you have touched on, women in classical music, uh, if I have it right, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, once upon a time, th there was a notion in classical music circles and in uh, orchestras that, uh, as it evolved, uh, that women could do some things, but not others. So. You could hire a woman to play flute, but clearly she's not going to play trombone or double bass because we know those are instruments played best by males. And then along the way came the technique of uh, screens so that it would lend some measure of objectivity to the actual quality of the performance and merit of the performer versus uh, uh, other considerations. T tell us what's changed 
and what hasn't changed and how you would assess the situation today? Well, I think that classical music, had, perhaps particularly in America, has become very invested in its tradition. I mean, when I say I want to empower people to have their own point of view, and this relates to your question, um, that's not what how the field has been presented to people. We all know lots and lots of orchestra subscribers and music fans who believe they don't know much about music, um, which is a terrible thing to do to our audience. You know, our audience, anybody that goes to the concert every Thursday night for 30 years ought to be full of opinions about music, not apologetic about their opinions about music. Um, I, this is a preamble to the answer to your question because when I took over at the New York Times, I was the first took over. I was a freelancer at the New York Times for seven years. I never had a job there, but I was the first woman regularly to review classical music at the New York Times in 2001, which seemed to me sort of ridiculous and embarrassing, but people made a big deal of it. There was a lot of pushback and response at the time um, to a woman finally doing this. And I wrote a piece in 2002 about being a woman critic and the resistance that it met and sort of the, the attitudes, that, the antiquated attitudes that you encountered. And it's funny that it then took me another good 10 years to really deal with that in terms of the field I was covering and to see how female composers have been affected with much more of that resistance and female conductors, God knows. Um, I mean, I wrote a little bit about it, but it took a while for me to think that it was okay to engage with that, partly because when you start as a critic, you're trying to prove yourself on the template of all the male critics who make you think that there are certain right things to write about and wrong things to write about. And I was always a bit of a maverick anyway. Um, it's been tremendous resistance. I did a piece in 2000, God, it was a couple of years ago, and it was 35 top female crit, uh, composers in classical music. And I will admit it was supposed to be 50 and it was going to be an online feature. And they decided they wanted to publish it and they pushed up the deadline on me. And I had only finished 35. So there are 15 female composers I feel really guilty about not having included. But um, I remember my editor saying, do you think you can find 35? And just thinking, oh my God, you know, the perception that the perception by an editor in the arts who didn't know about music, that there weren't that many women out there doing that was a painful thing to encounter, but really eye-opening as far as what critics can do, what all of us can do to sort of get the word out there. And let's note, we haven't even started talking about racial diversity in the classical music field, um, which is an even more painful topic. And long overdue for proper treatment, even as we all make noises about how to broaden that. Um, but, but your direct question being about women trying to find their way, I mean, going back to Hildegard von Bingen, there have been significant female contributions to classical music. Um, Amelie Meyer is one of my new pets who was a 19th century composer, and I found a contemporary review of her by a man saying, we all think women can't write orchestra music, but she is the exception, sort of waxing rhapsodic about her. And um, she wrote seven symphonies. She was quite well regarded in her day, but we've written her out of history again. Um, Dora Peyachevich, an early 20th century composer who's becoming one of my favorite composers right now, her, her symphony in F sharp minor sounds like a cross between Strauss and Mahler, but through a different filter. And um, one of the things female composers incidentally always run aground on is that we always compare them to the male composers they sound like to help you orient yourself, but that automatically puts them at a disadvantage since they're not the male composer. They are not second rate Strauss, they are first rate Dora Peyachevich. Um, but the struggle to loosen the walls of this canon, which is strangling our field anyway, and to bring into it the voices that are already there, let alone new voices, um, is an ongoing one. And here we are talking in the middle of the shutdown time. This is actually, for all of the pain that it's bringing to the classical music field, also an incredibly exciting time with regard to the possibilities for the future, because we can't, this season, probably we cannot count on large symphony orchestra performances of Mahler. We're gonna to have to change up our presentation and we're gonna to have to change up our programming. And one hopes that given the increased awareness in this field of the need for greater diversity, this will be a huge opportunity for finding all kinds of new ways to present music, many kinds of music under this general umbrella. And uh, thank you. Now, Danielle has been kind enough to send around in chat your 2002 
article that you mentioned. So if people haven't read it or want to reference that or open it up, it's there available to you. And as someone who has a background in graduate studies in German, I'm so heartened. I've been waiting for years for someone to say in one of these discussions the name Hildegard von Bingen. So thank you. You made my day. So we have 35 minutes left and the floor is open. If I may ask you, do your best to be succinct and tell us who you are and who would like to go first. And Danielle uh, will help me if I don't see a hand. Anne? Let me just jump in and say that thank you for putting in that, that link, Danielle, but the actual article I wrote was for andante.com. And I just <clears throat> we, um, we put it online in the context of an interview I gave in like December. Um, it's, it's called, I forget, it's called something about women in criticism, but it didn't run in the New York Times. Um, I'll Google it and I can put it up later, but um, I'm not going to try to work Google over a Zoom link right now. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, there's more. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Anne, and thanks, Danielle. So, so uh, Erica, <clears throat> I think I have you first on my list, and if you would tell us who you are. Sure. I actually just kind of raised my hand, so that was quick. Uh, I'm Erica Sipes, and I am a pianist in Roanoke, Virginia. Hi, Anne. And I met Anne uh, and her husband a while ago. And um, I have a trio here in Roanoke, and we perform all women's music. Or not all. We play a lot of different stuff, but we're focusing on researching and finding women composers through the uh, ages that we can find and introduce to people. So, but my question would be to Anne, um, you know, there, since you've had so much experience working with, I know you chat a lot with composers on Twitter, it seems, um, and you have developed so many wonderful relationships. What advice would you give to women in classical music, either composers, performers, you name it, in order to help kind of maybe change the attitude in the classical music world about our place, women's place in classical music? What can we do? Well, that's a really good question um, in a system that makes it challenging to do things. Um, I, think, I think everything anyone can do in our field, let's face it too, that our whole field is facing a, a diminution of gravitational pull, shall we say. We no longer occupy as classical music people the same place of prominence that we did in the 1950s. So every interaction with the public is a chance, proselytizes the wrong word, but a chance to illuminate what it is we do. And I think that, you know, women composers can very much do that. If you want to fall into stereotypes, women are better at that than men, but which I think is a foolish thing to say. But I think that building on relationships, building on ways to connect with people um, are all essential. And again, right now, as I say, we have, you know, who knows what the established organizations are going to be able to do. Um, any, any entrepreneurial things that one can think of um, to push themselves is, is going to be very helpful. I mean, a concrete example is Simona Dennerstein, the pianist, who was not doing very well in the conventional things you're supposed to do to have a pianist career. She wasn't winning competitions. She was doing little things. And then she got pregnant and she wanted to do something to mark her pregnancy. And she decided she would learn the Goldberg variations as sort of her personal milestone as she went through this. And then once she did it, she was so happy with it, she raised the money to record it. And look what happened to Simona Dennerstein. <laughs> um, that was completely her own initiative, a personal thing. And she got people on board who were so caught up in what she was doing that they did it too. But it was really interesting that as soon as she let go of like, okay, I'm never going to win a competition, forget it. I'm just going to record this music I love. She embarked on this career and her career has been amazing, only hampered by the fact that the field still wants to put her in templates that she doesn't fit into. Simona really does best when she's coming up with her own amazing projects. She's not somebody she can, she can go in and play a Beethoven concerto with an orchestra and that's fine, but that's not showing who she really is. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of the kind of thing you can do that it takes a lot of luck and a lot of ducks falling and lined up in a row or whatever, but, uh, but that kind of thing, absolutely. Um, and, and writing music you believe in and finding ways to perform it and maybe losing 
sight losing the idea that you have to write for a major orchestra, that you have to be performing in X hall, but just finding ways to perform that bring you into people's ears and hearts. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Anne. So who would like Jeffrey, please? You have to unmute yourself. I there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne, for letting me be part of this. It's just wonderful um, to see so many friends here. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Beagle. I'm a pianist. I live in New York, outside New York. And well, you don't have to tell me about women. I grew up in a house with three older sisters and my mom and my dad was a New York City cop. So women reigned in my life. <laughs> so, And uh, I studied with Adele Marcus, who was one of the most powerful women figures of the piano pedagogy world of the uh, 20th century. I can't imagine, with all due respect to my male friends, I can't imagine a, a stronger teacher and advocate for the piano than Adele, who's basically trained many people in the 20th century. Um, and so when it came to learning new music, and I created a project that became the first largest consortium of orchestras uh, to the date, it was like late 1998, I decided that it would have been a woman composer because I thought, you know, we, the great music we played by male composers, if I'm going to do something that's going to set the millennium on a new course, it's going to be a woman composer. And that's not really why I did that. It's not really why I chose Ellen. I chose Ellen because she was one of the most prolific composers of our time and had done so much for music. And I liked her music. That was my passion was because I liked her music, but I liked her. Well, and you Ellen, you mean Ellen Swillick, right? Ellen Tape Swillick, yes. And so she wrote a millennium piece and we had about 27 orchestras involved and went into other areas. But I think that it's there's, there's so many composers, so many women composers that are not uh, as well known. And um, actually, before the pandemic started, I've been in I'm in conversations with someone in uh, England, because there's a piece that's been haunting me for about 20 years called uh, Symphonic Waltzes by Dana Suisse, and it's not published. And I was able to track it down through the publisher, and he gave us full reign to have it taken from the score, I learned the whole piece. And it's been done by this friend in Europe. It's finally for the first time in almost 90 years in PDF publishable score and parts and we plan to record it. But it's a voice that very few people know about. Uh, and Dana was considered the girl Gershwin and I wanna to try to help get her piece out there. Hopefully when this is all behind us, we'll be able to record this and maybe I might invite Ann to even consider doing something about Dana Suisse for this project, maybe liner notes or something, but that's over the other side of the mountain. We're just not there yet. Uh, it's, we're not there, but. There are a lot of major works by female composers that are completely forgotten in our recent time. I mean, Louise Talma wrote an Alcestiad opera in the early 60s, um, completely forgotten. And I forget the the libretto was by somebody major. Um, it's a, it's a huge piece and just really literally completely forgotten. And uh, Sharon Sue, the pianist is on Twitter and she did a, a series of blog posts. She did a year where she was only gonna perform pieces by women. And she did a blog post on how wonderful it was and then a blog post on how challenging it was. And one of the huge challenges is just finding performable materials and then figuring out what you want to play of that because when you're playing Chopin, Beethoven, you kind of know what you like and what you don't like and when you're dealing with composers you've never heard of and then you get it in your fingers, maybe you discover you don't like it or maybe you like it because you've worked so hard to play it but then you become very self-conscious about is it really that good and in classical music where we have this sort of ironclad idea of what is a masterwork and what is not um, and you have people like me coming in then and punching a hole in your performance and well, this wasn't really that great. And you spend an entire year learning it. Um, you know, we, we need to break out of the system that propagates all of that. And her blog post made it really clear to me how challenging it was. And it was financially challenging just to get the parts and find the copies. So you've worked for six months to get your hands on a performing score of something where when you're working with a classic piece, you just go to get the Dover score and it's, you've got 15 editions and it's right there. And uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge in a lot of ways and it's gonna take a lot of work to do it. But I'm glad you. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Keep up the good Thank fight. Thank you. We'll try. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Ed. 
Who would like to join the conversation now? You know, somebody asked in the chats if there were going to be a series of books about uh, about forgotten women. And it's true that I have a couple of women in mind that I would like to write about. But I know that there is another novelist and her name escapes me right now. I think it's Mary Sharrett. And she has written, she is working on a series of books, not presented quite as a series, but her specialist, her specialty is sort of forgotten women. And um, she just did one on Alma Mahler recently, which was a very different and intriguing view of Alma Mahler. Um, it, it's on the, it's, it's sort of light, fun reading fiction, a little bit romantic, but seriously researched and, you know, certainly worth taking a look at for anybody who's interested in this line of thinking. So, so we, we, we do have a queue now, and I've got Emily next, Emily Phillips, Nicole Penn, and Steve Lagerfeld. Emily, you first, please. Hi, uh, Emily Phillips, I am. Uh, we know each other from Germany. Uh, I'm an artist. I live in San Francisco now. Um, one of the things that I thought was really mm, interesting, poignant, incredibly important that you brought up was this idea of the how do you disseminate the work of female composers when you have to deal with issues of um, marketing? You know, Beethoven has become a brand. All of these sort of male composers have become a brand of expected experience, experiences that people will have when they walk into um, a concert. Um, the idea of women being able to hold their own or do more is not part of that cycle. And it seems to me as if um, one of the issues perhaps is how do you get beyond tokenism? We have one within, within this whole season, we have one female composer, we've done our job type of thing. Right. Um, right. You can also see that with theater when it comes to um, theater dealing with African Americans, uh, Asians, et cetera, et cetera. We've had this discussion before. It's part of that same. So, and and part of I guess part of my question has to do with how much of that then has to do with the vision or lack of vision of the artistic director. And I understand that in America they're concerned about concert ticket sales and blah blah blah. But still, yeah, yeah, I'm completely. As you know, I'm completely um, behind that. I think that you absolutely need vision and and determination and drive, and you need to overcome the objections of your board. You need to overcome a dip in your ticket sales to convince people that it's worthwhile to try new things. Um, the dynamism that that creates is unmistakable. Um, I think one of the problems with classical music is that you get the Beethoven story over and over and over because it's safe and so you get the same people going and they're getting older and older and you have no way of renewing or refreshing the field and the field has become so wedded to these huge organizations this is one of my pet soapboxes that we have conflated the art with the organizations that present it and we're convinced that if orchestras and opera houses are struggling, that means classical music itself is in trouble. And classical music exists in many, many forms, many of which are not orchestras and opera houses. And these huge institutions suck all the money and energy out of the room and tell you that there's only certain things we can do to sell 3,000 tickets. That's probably true. Um, but if you start thinking in different scales and in different ways and of different ensembles, you have a lot of things you can do and a lot of ways to really excite an audience. And you can even excite a big audience if you think far enough outside the box. Um, I think that it's very hard in these fields to keep the vision and innovation going while keeping your multi-million dollar organization going. And this is not even a diss on people who are working themselves to the bone just to keep their head above water. They're the time for the kind of research and development work you should be doing um, or money is just not there for a lot of people. So it is up to smaller organizations. And again, that's why I say that this COVID time could be turned into a time of hope because there's suddenly room for innovation. People need innovation. There's going to be a bunch of months where those big concerts are not going to be so viable. And we're going to have to find ways to fill in those gaps and something new and fresh and forward looking might be just the way to go. 
um, something that reflects our community. Incidentally, Emily and I spent months planning out the greatest production of Macbeth ever seen, and somebody should definitely hire us to do it now. <laughs> so, so Anne, uh, I'm going to indulge myself. If there's, if there's a bit more to say right now, I would be eager to hear you say it. Th these larger institutions, uh, which are constrained by a need to sell tickets and cover overhead costs. Um, when did this start happening? And what kind of future do they have? If I look here in Washington, DC, no disrespect toward the institution or music intended, but I'm waiting to see a notice for the Christmas Nutcracker opening next week. Uh, <laughs> I think sheer madness is now running, you know, 37 years in a row. I look for things that I want to attend, but, but it's it's pretty thin. So w when did this begin happening? Do we just reconcile that these larger institutions will do popular shows to large groups to cover bills, and we give up as as on them as fora for experiment? innovation, so something new? Is it all moving to small or is there something that can be done to, if not turn around, adapt some of these larger iconic institutions? Well, you know, Deborah Borda, female administrator, first at the Los Angeles Philharmonic and now at the New York Philharmonic, has done a lot to really pep up first the LA Philharmonic and now the New York Philharmonic. The New York Philharmonic was in the middle of a two season push commissioning 19 female composers in a big project to commemorate the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, which was dynamic and exciting. I mean, it was, she was really breathing life into that institution, so it can be done. But yes, I do think a lot of the innovation is happening on a smaller scale. I think there's a lot of smaller groups that are doing exciting things. Um, I was at an Opera America conference a couple of years ago, and Matthew Schilbach of the um, San Francisco Opera was talking about visiting fundraisers and he went out to Google because he's in San Francisco and he was in the Google headquarters and everybody's skateboarding around and playing ping pong and writing on the whiteboards or windows and magic marker. And he said, he thought, gosh, I wish I worked at a creative company. And then he heard himself, <laughs> he runs an opera house and he had this epiphany and it stuck with me too because I'm sure anybody who's worked in a large arts organization totally gets it. It's not actually creative. You're working so hard to get the stuff there. It becomes this kind of straitjacket. And, and what we do is defined by the form. Like we have to get grand opera on stage. So therefore we need works with a big orchestra and a big chorus. And when we write new works, it has to fit in that straitjacket. And I think we've all seen some wonderful composers totally hampered in their efforts to write something new for a house like the Metropolitan Opera. I mean, Nico Muli comes to mind. I think Nico Muli is a wonderful composer and he's written two big operas for the Met, neither of which shows at all his best work. And I don't even think it's his fault. I think when you have to produce opera product, you get sort of, unless your natural thing is to write that way and it's a sort of 19th century form. Um, <clears throat> but, but I do think that there are some big organizations breaking the mold. I would hope ideally, to see fewer big organizations, as painful as that is, and more small organizations and a more organic, dynamic mix of, of work. Um, but I could make you a list of things in Washington, D.C., like the In Series, wonderful chamber group that does really interesting performances of opera um, that are well worth going to. And incidentally, the other big question mark in D.C. right now, um, Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center just spent $250 million building a new annex called the Reach of rehearsal spaces that are supposed to be alternative performance spaces. And nobody had done any programming after the opening festival to figure out what was going to go in the thing. But now in the time of COVID-19, this could be the time with some visionary programming to let the reach come to life because there are no fixed seats. It's all sort of alternative spaces. Audiences can mill around. You could maybe do shorter performances and have people come through or just there's room for using it in creative ways. And the Kennedy Center could redeem itself somewhat for this $250 million expense on this beautiful suite of spaces by finding some kind of solution of what to put in them that deals with the time we're in right now. Good, thank you, Ann. Uh, we're going to get as many people in as we can, and we still have 15 minutes left. I have Nicole Penn 
followed by Charles Davidson, and then we'll continue after that. Nicole, and do uh, tell us who you are. Yes. Hi, um, I'm uh, Nicole Penn, Program Manager of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, and I had a long life in the Cavalier Marching Band at the University of Virginia, and I still play flute, so <laughs> a slightly different um, point of view, but um, I, one of my favorite shows of the past four years was Mozart in, in the Jungle. I just thought it was a brilliant way to kind of, you know, uh, popularize the, the classical music world and sort of a hip, exciting, offbeat way to younger audiences. Um, and one of the stories that I really appreciated was the transition of the female oboists from a performer to a conductor. And I was wondering, what role do you see? I mean, I really... I know there are many female conductors out there, but um, what role do they have in perhaps popularizing music composed by women, um, perhaps shaping and, and making the uh, the classical musical world more exciting? Um, if if you think that they they might bring something new to this field, yeah, I think we're seeing a shift of more orchestra administrators and more female conductors, more female orchestra administrators and more female conductors, and that that does mean a shift. It's being it's slower in the opera field, and I think that's playing out in what they present too. Um, absolutely, I think that um, particularly conductors, because it's such a visual change from the the hidebound tradition there there has to be a change to let a woman be on the, compo on the podium, to let a woman be leading in that way. And I think we've seen female conductors, you know, doing great things. Although when I said, as I, when I began as a critic and as a female critic, I felt I had to sort of prove myself to the men. You have that with female conductors as well. If you just come in and are doing all this wild stuff, then you're going to get a part of the, the, not just the audience, but the gatekeepers saying, oh, well, she just does that weird stuff. You know, you have to really prove that you can do, you know, Mahler, whatever. Um, and you have a conductor like Simone Young, who is now entering her second act, um, wonderful female conductor who had a really rough couple of years after the birth of her second child, had some bad performances, took some time off, built her way back up, the first woman to conduct a Bruckner cycle, and she gets pot shots at her all the time. And she's just now, um, in the last year, she's been playing in America more again and getting huge excitement because she is a really kick-ass conductor. Um, but you have to sort of prove yourself in the grind. If you want to really play at the New York Philharmonic level, you have to prove yourself in the grind of the male conductors as well. Um, but you see also women founding smaller ensembles and coming up that way. Um, I agree that that is a really positive development for the field. And again, let us say, conductors of color as well, who have been also struggling, and there are many wonderful conductors of color, um, the more we can remember that the world is made up of many different people, the better off we are in any field. Thank you very much, and over. Thank you, Nicole, and and Charles. Over to you. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Anne. This is really uh, fascinating and wonderful. Um, you mentioned uh, this California Creative Company, and this person's reaction is thinking, "Gosh, I, I wish I worked in a creative place." And I was just wondering if you had ever written about impresarios and some of the people who are uh, were not running or or didn't run boring companies. I mean, obviously, everybody thinks of Javi Lev or not on the creative side, but creative performers and new people, Saul Hurok, and I guess Joe Horowitz has been, Jeff has brought into our orbit uh, with BAM, arguably, uh, perhaps not Jagilev, but he was also a music critic and has done interesting things. Have you written about these people and what do you think is the role of the impresario in all of this? And it's that? funny. I on my, on my story list for years, almost since I got to the post, I wanted to do a piece about the quirky performance spaces, like the spaces around the country that have been giving performances for 40 years in an old barn or, you know, that has a huge audience following in Des Moines, Iowa. And um, nobody, my editors never quite went for it. It was one of those sort of evergreen stories that never got the green light. Is that really interesting enough? I think, I think it is interesting. I think that there are a lot of creative impresarios operating on a smaller scale, even in different parts of the country. And I think one huge problem with the field in our country is that everybody's reinventing the wheel. Another silver lining of this COVID crisis is that people are talking to each other much more than they had been. Um, 
not just within fields, but across fields and across geographical boundaries. And I have a sense that people are getting a better picture of what they're up to. Um, whereas before, the lessons that one orchestra was learning might not even reach another orchestra. And everybody was sort of trying to tackle the same problems in their own little ways. Um, but I agree, there's a lot of fascinating stuff to be written about how you how you get stuff on stage. I did write a piece about boards, um, which is another big part of it, because I've seen a lot of exciting vision founder in year two or three, bewilderingly to me, because the board got cold feet. Um, the Washington National Opera is an example where after one of their best ever seasons with the premiere of the revised version of Philip Glass's Appomattox and The Ring, which was one of the great rings I've ever seen, um, they almost immediately retrenched. Um, they well, oh, you know, new new opera doesn't really sell, and they they became much more timid. And I was like, you had one of the great successes of my opera-going life. You should be trumpeting that and not reacting to the fear of the board. So it is a complicated algebra. But I agree, there's a lot a lot to be written and a lot to be said about that. I would add, I suppose that like education, it's not a sexy story for editors. And the other hardest story to pitch to anybody, as you guys know, is arts education because there's nothing bad to be said. You don't want to say that it's bad to teach kids about the arts, but it's, there's not really an angle that feels sexy to people. So, so Anne, on that subject and Charles's question, and you're, you're sharing with us that, that you wanted to write about creative impresarios in this subject area, but you could never get an editor interested. I just want to add, there is this publication called The American Interest. <laughs> so I'm just saying, we could talk. We okay. could talk. I'll bear that. Okay. In I want to say too, I'm not dissing my editors. This is like not about one editor, lest somebody hear this and be like, oh, who's she talking about? This was a general observation about publications, except the American interest. Uh, understood, crystal clear. So, so next on my list, uh, forgive me, I, I'm going to pr pronounce it a German way. Melana Müller, and I'm sure that's entirely inappropriate and wrong. So, and I see you there laughing at me. So you can have a joke at my expense. Tell us how, how I correctly pronounce your name and tell us who you are. Thanks for your, your patience. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, that wasn't yep. too bad at all. Melan Müller. <laughs> Thank and you, I'm, Milan. Tell us who you are and then ask your question or make your comment. I'm American by birth. I, I, I live in England. <clears throat> I'm joining you from uh, Portsmouth, England at the moment. And hi, Anne. It's nice to see you. See you. Uh, I come at this from a perspective of in the recording industry, which I haven't heard mentioned uh, today. So uh, that, that's, I think we're having different experiences in the recording industry than we are in uh, you know, live performance um, and uh, you know, lo lots of other uh, classical music uh, perspectives. Um, I, I own uh, a, a, a independent classical label, Avi Records. And for right now, we're actually doing quite well. Great. Both in uh, digital streaming, which might not sound surprising at all, but also CD sales wow. are doing quite well. Wow. But from the, uh, the female recording perspective, I'm also seeing um, a lot of connection, a lot of female musicians, whether it's um, you know, conductors like Marin Alsop, uh, composers like Anna Klein, who I mentioned on the online chat, um, performers, Rachel Barton Pine, uh, violinist, in Balsagev, you know, a cellist. We have a recording coming out with her <laughs> as it happens next month. Just really making connections um, and um, be because we can, um, you know, online these days and being really, you know, fruitful with creativity. Um, so in the recording, you know, industry, I suppose, you know, we, we might have more advantages these days. Well, one of the challenges is going to be, I think, moving forward and how we're going to continue making recordings. 
where the, the money is the big question for everybody because this shutdown is affecting the economic underpinnings across the board. Well, but yeah. as, as yeah. you know, I wrote, about, I wrote about the recording industry some years ago. I, I did write about that and I even mentioned you. And uh, the fact that there's a lot more creativity possible in the recording industry and that somehow that is not reflected in the concert hall. That was the subject of my piece. I can't remember, it was a couple years back. Yeah. Uh, and I still find that bewildering. And the other fact is that your company, you were taking projects that are dear to the hearts of artists and realizing them. You were not the traditional recording company where a gatekeeper says, let's make another Beethoven cycle with Andres Nelson's conducting yet his 19th symphonic cycle. Um, and as a result, your projects are all coming out of a place of deep involvement and it's quite competitive. I mean, artists are, are sending you many more proposals than you can realize for these projects. So you get to pick the cream of things that interest you. Um, but it is fascinating and it's still very much true. And I'm happy to hear you're doing well in the shutdown, that there's so much more creativity possible in the recorded sphere than reaches the concert hall, which is another example of the weird disconnect that these big institutions have with the world around them, that maybe recording is not as disconnected by anymore. Yeah, ab absolutely. The, 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 there will be challenges going ahead. Um, you know, as the shutdown has happened, that you know the, the the financial you know model is is not as robust as it will be. But um, you know, speaking with artists and not just you know females as well, but um, all sorts of you know trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, yet yet again, and it's um, it, it's an anxious time, but kind of an exciting time to try to you know come up with with new models as well. That it's great to hear that reflected. I mean, because I'm seeing in some of the, we're all getting a little bit sick of Zoom performance with this mosaic of people all playing their violins at home. But mm -hmm. I've seen certainly in some of these productions, a creativity and spark and involvement that I've missed on the stage. There's one singer in particular whom I've never been a huge fan of on stage and his, his YouTube channel during this time is, I'm addicted to it, it's wonderful, partly because it has all of the spontaneity and excitement that the opera business cultivates out of people. You know, you're so fixed on trying not to make a mistake, um, not just the opera business, but classical music has been so focused on this illusion of perfection um, that it's kind of terrified performers into, uh, when it comes to live performance. And of course, recording, you have a little bit of a cushion because you can do a retake, you know, where you can cut. Um, but I, I hope we get away from that altogether. I hope we see grittier, rougher performances. Yeah, well, we shall see. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so thank you. Now, now we're reaching that painful moment where everybody's warmed up, everybody's on a roll, and I'm the bad guy. I'm going to call on Alison Fr Franzetti to, to pose a final question or offer a final comment, and then we're going to wrap up. Alison? Hi. Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. We're good. Okay, terrific. Hi, and thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jeffrey. And hi, Jeffrey Beagle. Uh, I'm Allison Brewster Franzetti. That's my full professional name, and I am based in New Jersey. And I have a couple of thoughts based on what I'm listening to here. One is that I was really intrigued with your mention, Anne, about 1797, about that dictionary and women being talked about and looking at perspective and what the attitude might have been at that time that women would have been so freely mentioned as opposed to now where we feel like we are still struggling for our place. So I was curious, one, about your perspective on that. And the other part that goes with that is that I'm wondering if we are actually in too much danger of trying to be almost too politically correct and too pigeonholing by identifying ourselves as women performers, women composers, African-American, Hispanic, like my husband is a Hispanic composer, for example. And how do we break that mold so that we're not identifying that way? I personally don't. I personally identify as I'm a pianist, I'm an artist. I don't put myself in the women mold. And so I'm curious what you have to say about that. My thoughts about that have changed a lot. I'm gonna start with that question first because when I came to the New York Times, the Times was embarrassed about not having, ever having had a woman. So they only considered women for their next freelance position. There were three women in the running, I believe, and I got it. Um, 
I wouldn't have come to the Times if it weren't for that affirmative action piece. It wasn't the thing you applied for. They called you up, you know, but I was, I was in the mix. Um, so I was the woman. I was hired because I was a woman. And, um, and being a female critic has given me a real perspective. I mean, when I left the post and people were talking about who would take over, um, I was talking to a friend of the business who said, well, they shouldn't hire a woman for the sake of hiring a woman. I said, yes, but you have to admit that my being a woman has given me a different perspective that has given me a platform in this field that's distinctive. Much of what I achieved is because I offered that perspective. And she said, well, actually, you're right. Um, so it's a catch-22. And I also saw at the Washington Post, the Washington Post for a long time had a real mission to diversify the newsroom. And they hired a lot of people of color. It, is, it was, when I got there, less so now, the most diverse workplace I'd ever been in. Um, that's not saying much. It wasn't 50%, but it was diverse. And um, that meant really looking for people from different backgrounds, different kinds of expertise, different kinds of skill sets, and it made it a better paper. And that became, that was really Catherine Graham that made that happen. It became a little bit less of a priority and you can feel the change. And I feel it's a little bit of a diminution. So insofar as those two cases are both a form of affirmative action, I think we still need it. I think that in order to get the numbers up, we need to actually be like, yes, we do need to program more women. We do need to program more people of color. We do need to think about that enough to make it slightly equitable because otherwise we're going to continue with the tokenism, with the one woman and the one person of color on a program and think that's okay. And it's really not. And that could lead to some weaker programming as we get up to speed on who's out there. Um, Rob Diemer at SUNY Pur Purchase, no, Fredonia, he has a composer diversity database that he started. And you can Google that. It's now the Composer Diversity Institute. And it's thousands of names, many people you haven't heard of. And there's a lot of good people in there that we haven't heard of. Um, that said, I completely understand the resistance of all women, including myself, to be thought of as women composer and women conductor and women critic, rather than just who we are and what we do. Um, but I think we have a ways to go until we can totally afford to lose the tag, although each of us as individuals, of course, has to forget about that when we're working, since we don't want to work to be good female composers, you know, we want to work mm -hmm. to be the best we can be. Um, and taken as equals. But certainly from the point of view of institutions, I think they can't afford not to be looking at that. Um, so I, I feel that pretty strongly. Um, and what was your other? You had mentioned about the dictionary. Oh, the dictionary. Right. Right. And, yeah. I was, and I was asking you about perspective, what that it was so accepted at that point. I mean, and that here we are struggling for something that was so obviously accepted then and I'm, i mean i can't we can't pretend that there was complete equity in 1796 and i'm not saying there was yeah. but it was just that you brought up a very interesting point and that's why i wanted to hear more about it it is interesting i mean i there was an a, a women's magazine came out with an inaugural issue and the issue said you know we're all used to seeing magazines written for women by men in which men tell us what to think this magazine is our effort to make to make our own. We're going to say what we think. And that magazine was published in 1793. Mm -hmm. And I imagine these women sitting at home, including my heroine, which is why I read the magazine. Um, she definitely read it. It was published in the next town over. Um, you know, women sitting at home reading this going, yeah, sister, you go. And we think we invented this in the 1960s, you know, and it was really exciting and bewildering to me to see that it existed so early. Um, you know, women didn't have an equal place at all. Although, interestingly, in Vienna in that era, evidently when you walked through the streets and were looking at house construction projects, there were women as well as men in the building crews. Um, so as far as perspective, you know, all you can try to do is recreate that perspective, which is another reason I want to do it as a novel, to show a world in which women had it a little more equitably than we think. <laughs> So, so uh, Allison, thanks. No, Sarah, I'm, I'm breaking all rules for you because your hand is up and I don't want everybody mad at me. <laughs> but we are over time. So, so be brilliant and be succinct. Hi. Hi, Anne. How are you doing? 
fine. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I was going to sort of just add to your point. Um, what was has been very, I'm, my name is Sarah Santa Rogio and I'm a cellist. I have a trio called the Eroica Trio. And um, what I found really fascinating in the, particularly the first maybe 10 years of my career um, was, well, first the big shock that all of a sudden I didn't, I, we had not thought of ourselves as three females because we started playing together when we were 12 years old. So we thought of ourselves as three kids who love playing music together. So we were really shocked after we won the Nauberg competition how we just kept getting all these doors like slammed in our faces and they would say outright you're too pretty to be able to play well but once we which was a wonderful opportunity because it just we were able to throw out the rule book and just do what we did best um and but then when we were starting to get a lot of press coverage what i found fascinating was that the mainstream journalists we're not at all surprised that we were at the top of the field. Like it didn't occur to them to say, wait, you're three girls, how is that possible? But the classical press absolutely right, right. would slam us time after time after time for being three girls. Um, and then at first they would be like, you can't play well enough. But then once we became very successful, then they were like, they're only successful because they're three girls. Right, right. Um, but what I found really interesting was that often the first question that they asked us was, uh, what are you going to do about kids? And I would always turn around with a smile on my face and say, how many children does Yo-Yo Ma have? And they'd say, what? And I said, have you interviewed Yo-Yo Ma before? And they'd say, oh, of course. And I'd say, how many kids does he have? And they'd say, I don't know. And so I say, the day that you can answer that question is the day that I'll answer your question. <laughs> and, you know, it just was like, <sighs> so I have to say, I totally agree with you. In the big institutions, we need affirmative action for people of color, for females, for anyone who's not a white male, because it is every step of the way, it's systemic. Yeah. They are barring admission. They will take one and then they hold them up as see we're not like sexist we've got this one female composer or this one female artist um so i agree with black you. man on the, our our um african-american history month program in february so therefore yes exactly <laughs> why is there one month for african-americans there's 12 months for whites right you know why is there one month one day for women one day so i i you know, I, the other thing that I was just going to say, which um, I have a very diverse group of friends. I have a lot of people of color who are friends of mine. I have a lot of people who are from the LGBTQ community. Um, and I've always said to all of them, every single one of us if who's being pushed down by the man, I mean, whatever, if we banded together, we would be the, the vast majority and we could raise everyone up, not just our one little tiny group, but everyone because a rising tide raises all boats, you know? So I agree with you. I, I think that we shouldn't try to pretend we're not women or not people of color because you walk in the room, you are that. Yep. But we should just say, yes, and I also have two legs. <laughs> so do you, you know? I mean, it's just one of the things. Anyway, so I agree with you, and I think that I worry that now we're getting to a point where people are, I'm hearing it, people are starting to think, well, we did our job, so now we can just let it go again. And I don't think we're anywhere close to parity or equity. I will say that I wrote an article in which I interviewed Erica Nickrens um, of your trio in 2004 for the New York Times called The Curse of Beauty for Serious Musicians. And much of it is still true. And it was a, there was a mention of, of your record cover where you decided just to have your faces so that you didn't get the flack about your bodies. And then everybody said you had a come hither look. Ah, <laughs> and oh yeah, no, really. and that album, Erica was, uh, had just given birth. Adela was nine months pregnant. And I had lost 20 pounds because I'd had Lyme disease very, very seriously. 
So all three of us were like totally not looking our best and still we got the flag. But I also, I also have to say once uh, in a video that I made, music video, I, there was a huge thing going on about how I had breast implants because I'm not very well endowed. And, I, and someone said to me, oh my gosh, you've got to see this entire chat room devoted to your breast implants. So I went on, I said, you idiots, did you look at my stomach? I was eight and a half, half months pregnant. <laughs> That's what happens when you're pregnant, you know? You become a food supply. And people were like, Whoosh, you know. So oh, I had an entire chat room discussing my relationship with my husband based on something I wrote that had nothing to do with sex whatsoever. I mean, but that's that's not just women. That's yeah, being that's everywhere. It's gonna be internet chat rooms about us, whatever, you know, anybody who says something in public. Right. But, and on that optimistic note, Jeff, you seem to be muted. <laughs> There we are. So Sarah, thank you, and thank you. So, so uh, Danielle, uh, wherever you are out there, thank you for organizing us and hosting us. Our associate publisher, Charles, thank you for publishing us and joining in today. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to look, there are great comments in chat. Uh, I'm gonna spend time afterwards looking at them, but really fine recommendations and observations. What a fabulous group. I'd like to suggest from Roanoke to Riverdale to Europe, in the fall, we'll extend an invitation to you in person for a glass of wine with Anne and a piece of pizza or a salad or something like that. But 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 most important, Anne, oh. you're uh, you're superb, and everything was shining through today. Your intelligence and your energy and your curiosity. But what a pleasure to spend an hour and ten minutes with you. You were very gracious and very generous. And we all thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And I'd love to do it in person. <laughs> Great. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a do wonderful it. day. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah.